All right, turn your Bibles to Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. We're going to go into the OT, right? So uh, many of you guys know, I uh, kind of started this off this series called For Such a Time as This. For Such a Time as This. Uh, we will be uh, going through the book of Esther for, I predict, about uh, eight weeks, okay? Uh, maybe more, uh, depending on what the Lord leads. But um, I, know, I don't know if um, you are this way, but how many of you guys are readers here, right? Readers who love to read, right? I love to read, and uh, uh, I specifically have been going through uh, a book series, and uh, this is uh, called The Pastor's Soul. It's more of a leadership uh, backslash Christian genre. Uh, and I know there's many different types of, of books out there. Some of you guys like drama and suspense and sci-fi and all these different things. But me, for now, in my, in my life, just reading through The Pastor's Soul. And as I shared, uh, it's a three-part series. Um, it's, uh, there's one, uh, the first book, Pastor's Soul, The Pastor's Family, and The Pastor's Ministry. Right, so there's a three-part series. I'm in the book number one. I've been really enjoying it, uh, and, and many of you guys love to read. Uh, fantastic! Uh, and and we're, as we dive into this, uh, this is a genre uh, of the Old Testament, and it's a three-part trilogy. Right, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Uh, let me just give you a kind of a, a a background on studying Scripture. Any book of the Bible, right? Uh, and I said this last week, but let me just kind of go over it again. So whenever you study God's words, you want to do three things. You want to observe, you want to be able to interpret, and then you have to apply, okay? Observe, interpret, apply. The more you observe the text, right, the more you observe it, it's easy for you to interpret the text, and then after that, really relish in applying the text, Right? So it's not about just application. So we read a word and you say, hey, how does that apply for me? No, we have to understand these three process, this three-step process of observing the text. And then after that, it's easier for us to interpret the text. And then after that, we can apply the text in our lives. So as we study the book, right, or any book, we have to know who the author is and we have to know who the audience is. The author and the audience, right? So if you have a study Bible, it actually gives you and breaks those things down to help you and parse it for you so that's easier for you to interpret what it's saying and then apply in your life, right? Moreover, we have to know what the purpose of the book is. Each of the book of the of Scripture has different purposes, right? So we have to know what the purpose is. And we have to know the context, right? So we have to know what's going on before, and we have to know what goes on after, all right? So, so we don't take things out of context, right? How many of you guys have been taken out of context before, right? Amen? All right. We've been taken out because they're not listening to the pre and the post, okay? And then we also have to understand the time period of when this particular book was written, we have to understand also the main characters and the theme and that God is overall displayed. God is always in control. That's the theme of it all, right? So that's the undercurrent of what God is doing. He's using lives. He's using people, ordinary people, to do amazing things for him. So in the book of Esther, we have the author, Mordecai, most likely, who, uh, 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 who's Esther's cousin, which we'll, we'll see shortly. And then the audience of this are the Jews. Okay, so who are these Jews? So remember, um, uh, th these are the, the four large or, or pow uh, powerful nations during the time. We had the Babylonians, right? We found that uh, in the book of uh, Daniel, okay, right? So you have the Babylonians that, who, that took over Jerusalem and all the parts of the Middle East and other parts of Africa and Asia and Europe. So the Babylonians, after the Babylonians, we have the Persians that came in. So the Persians overtook the, the, the power from the Babylonians. And after that, we have the Persians, we have the Greeks. Remember with Alexander the Great, right? And after his shortfall, like he didn't survive very long, but he conquered many areas at his time, at his young age. And then we have the Romans, right? So this is where in the New Testament, where you had the ruling power of the Romans. 
But in particular, in the book of Esther, we have the time of the Persians. The Persians, okay? So the Persian Empire extended from India, what you guys know of India, all the way to Iran, okay? Sorry, uh, not Iran, all the way up to Egypt, right? In particular, Ethiopia. Many of you guys have been watching the news, right? You've been seeing, you know, what's, uh, what's going on uh, with the, the Houthis, right? And all that stuff in the Red Sea. Those are all in these areas that are still in existence today. And the center capital of the Persian Empire is a city called Susa, common day Iran, what we guys know of Iran, okay? Now, one of the things that are very unique in the book of Esther is that the book of Esther and Ruth are the only two books in the Bible named after a woman, okay? And we're going to talk about that a little bit and the roles of women. And uh, as I shared, it's a three-part trilogy, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and it's the only book in the Bible without mentioning God's name, Yahweh, Jehovah, right? Jireh, right? All that. So it's, it's, there's, no, there's no mentioning, but we see the hands of God written in through the scripture of this book. We see the hand of God of how God puts people in places at the right time for the right purpose, right? So, so here's the situation. So let me just kind of recap in chapter 1. The situation is the kingdom of Persia was in power. They were the powerhouse of that time after dynasties, after dynasties, right? And then you have King Xerxes, named King Azarius is his other name, is the reigning king after his father, King Darius. So King Xerxes was the fourth king of the Persian Empire. In his fourth year or fourth reign, he wanted to show his strength to the nation, so many of you guys have seen this in uh, probably in the 80s or maybe in the 60s where you had countries, they would parade their, their soldiers, right? You had like the dictator, right? Uh, and then you had their, 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 their soldiers and all their tanks and their missiles and all those different things. This is essentially what he's doing. But all, the only difference is this is not a one-day event. This was 180 days, okay? So his chariots and all these different things, all his power and his splendor, he showed cases this to everyone in the persian empire and then after that he takes a special six-day banquet and to show his elitists right to show off his most prized possession who is that it's queen queen vashti only to be rejected right only to be rejected after everybody so imagine this you're showing off Man, you're showing off like big time. Not just one day. You're showing off for 180 days. Tackle that. You, 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 uh, it's eight additional days. And then only at the end, right, you save the very best for last. She rejects him. I don't know if she was having like a bad hair day or what. I don't know what it is, right? Maybe she woke up on the wrong side of the bed. We'd never know. The text never really specifically says that. But she disobeyed what the king wanted her to do, right? So what the result was the king was angry. In haste, he seeks his advisors, and he validate, and they validate that this is wrong for the queen to reject the king, especially in front of all these people. It was like a slap to the face, right? Slap to the face, and it was indicated as a direct insult to the king. Moreover, the advisors wondered of the repercussion of this action, right? By the queen to the women so, and to their husbands. So what is that saying? What does that communicate that basically if the king says this or a husband says this and the wife says no, that that's what's going to happen? So, so it, it's, it's like it, it, it's very specific in this situation and now it's affecting, they're thinking, this is going to affect the kingdom. Hey, we need to stop this right now, right? So, so let me, let, so, so what did they do? They, they, they're, they're pretty smart, so to say. So they said, hey, you know what, king? Let's go make an edict. Let's make a law. Let's make an executive decision right now, right? That King Vashti can no longer be queen. And that her position is now vacant. It's more, it's, it's open to somebody more worthy than her. Let this be an example that all women, quote unquote, will give honor to their husbands 
great and small, right? So, so, so here's my objective here. I, I just want to give you a brief on chapter one. It's, this is one of my favorite books here. I love it. So, so here's my objective. Number one, the supremacy of God over man's power and influence. In that sense, God is superior over man. God is so superior over man's power, his intellect, his, uh, his, his desires to rule the world, right? Man, this is a power kingdom, okay, per, the, king, the, the kingdom of Persia. So God is supreme. Number two, God moves in ways that you can't imagine. Remember, his, his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my thoughts, right? And number three, God is not done with his plans to redeem, right? To redeem, actively redeem those that are his, right? He's in the business of buying back. He's in business. Only he could do that. So, so, so that's just kind of a recap. So now let's go into Esther chapter 2, verse 1 to 20. I know it's a lot, okay? But you guys get cold. Remember, you guys wore those jackets. So you guys can all stand up and get warmed up as we read God's word, okay? And I'm going to try to take my time because I tend to talk fast sometimes. It says this, Esther chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the anger of King Azaharis had subsided, he remembered Vashti and that she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young girl to the citadel of Susa, to the harem, into the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the woman. And let their cosmetics be given to them. Let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in the place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Verse 5. Now there was at the citadel of Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem into the captives who had been exiled with uh, Jehoiakim. Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Now it came about when the command and the decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Hegai, that Esther had been taken to the king's palace into the custody of Hegai, who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him, so he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known uh, her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. Now when the turn of each young lady came to, uh, to go into the king. King Azaharis, at the end of her 12 months under the regulations of the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as, as follows. Six months of oil, of myrrh, and six months with spices and cosmetics for the women. And the young lady would go in to the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given her to take with her from the harem of the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and the morning she would return to the second harem to the custody of Shehazagaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She should not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, 
the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to the king. She did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the woman, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Azaharis, to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is in the month of Tabeth, in the seventh, uh, seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so, she, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for all the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done under his care. You may be seated. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, all right. So you've read the text, and now, remember, I talked about situation, right? The situation, remember star, situation, task, action, results, right? The situation is the situation. Now the task is at hand, and God is doing the tasking here, okay? God is doing the task, because remember, God is superior over man. Okay, so here's my point. Number one, God uses men's failure to fulfill his purpose. God uses man's failure to fulfill his purpose. What, is the, what are the man's failure? The king, king can communicate to the queen, but he failed. Imagine that. If, imagine if he's just said, hey, um, Queen Vashti, I have a little surprise at the end. I want to show you off to everybody else, okay? But for some reason, he failed at communicating, right? He failed. How many of you guys know that actually really happened, right? Does that happen in your house? Don't raise your hand, okay? Right? So, so the women, so I, I know this, okay? I've been married for uh, 20 years, going on 21, right? I know you guys are probably thinking, oh, yeah, that's only 20 years. I'm, like, married, like, for 100 years, okay? So um, anyway, so what, one thing I know about women, the little thing that I know, one thing I know for sure is that women do not want to be surprised. Amen? Right? Who likes, who wants to be surprised here? Right, as a woman. Okay, maybe some. Okay. Are you do surprised? Okay. But, but this surprise? This, this surprise? I don't know about that. Okay? So, so think about this. All right? So, so, so I know that women don't want to, especially in front of everybody. Okay? As a response, the advisors came with the grand plan. They had an idea. Hey, king, we have this great idea, okay? To save the king's face, right, and reputation, not realizing that God has got this. Imagine that, right? The plans of the, for the future and to redeem the Jews. He's going to use this very sad moment of miscommunication between a husband, the king, and his wife, the queen, so recall, let me just give you just a little example and just kind of what's going on in the, in the Jews during this time. So remember, the Jews were recognized as God's people in Genesis chapter 12, right? It started in the book of Genesis uh, with the character named Abram in Genesis 12. But things didn't pan out, right? Sin in the palace, right? So what happens was they started wanting to be, you know, all their neighbors had kings, Right? How can we as Jews, how come we can't have kings, right? How, as Israel, right? How come we can't have kings? So God gave them King Saul. That didn't pan out well, right? Gave him King David. Yes, he did mighty things, but his household was a mess, right? And then Solomon, right? He had some issues, okay? Like a lot of issues. You know what I'm talking about, right? And then you had Jeroboam and then Rehoboam. Then the, then the kingdom split. Right? The kingdom split, and then it went south from there. So therefore, because of sin in the palace, in the kings, right, and their children, they were exiled into Babylon, right? Remember, I was talking about that. Babylon was the powerhouse at that time. And then after the fall of Babylon, the Persians came in. That's when you have the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah, uh, uh, Ezra was commissioned to go back to his, to his land. 
Nehemiah built the walls, right? They were discouraged, built the walls. And Esther falls in during that time period. Jerusalem was in the rebuilding stage. This is called the second temple period after the Babylonian captivity. Now that King Xerxes was on the throne, he had all the power, he had all the land, he had all the splendor, he had the, all the military, he had all the resources. All he wanted except there was one problem. The queen rejected his request. Now there was a vacancy and God was going to use this moment, as you'll find out, a beauty pageant, believe it or not, a beauty pageant to save his people. Can you imagine, right? Only God could write this. Only God could write this. His, uh, so, so, so that's what happened. Yes, right? So he uses circumstances, yes, even bad ones, to show that he is the supreme God. I, wonder, I want you to understand that, that he's supreme God. So let me ask you this. Why do men fail? Why do men fail, all right? Not just leaders, not just those that hold public office or key roles in society. I'm talking about those averages. Why do husbands, why do fathers, why do they fail? Young men, why do they fail? Again, no one particular order. I'm going to share with you three things. Number one, physical exhaustion. You're physically exhausted, needing rest. God gave us the Sabbath to give you rest. The work that you do is hard work. And you need to devote that day in resting in God's presence. You know, the Jews, they follow the Shabbat law is what they call it. So from sundown in uh, in, in, um, in, uh, Friday all the way up to Sunday, like actually like uh, Saturday night, They have the Sabbath. Everything closes. They have family time. They have quality time. They're not allowed to work, and they use that to their advantage, right? I've known in particular Jews, right? Some believers, uh, um, um, Messianic Jews, some not. But they follow the Sabbath, and they're like, they, they tell me this, Jackson, every weekend is like a vacation in my house. Amazing. Because they don't do any of that. They work and get ready in preparation, so they spend time worshiping and spending time together as a family. Right? So when you don't have rest, you're on the go. Remember, the job is always going to be there, y'all. The job is going to be there. Okay? You are easily replaceable. Just FYI. Someone is going to want your spot at some point. Probably someone younger because it's cheaper. Okay? Just, Just saying. All right? Your physical being is so important. And it ties into the mental, because what happens is when we're physically exhausted, we also, if that's not taken care of, you have mental frustration. You have mental frustration. You get frustrated. Why am I still doing this? You ask yourself. Why am I doing this? Right? They're not even listening. No one wants to listen to me, blah, 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 right? All these different things. Why am I doing this? So you're, that tells you you're frustrated. Number three, right? You're spiritually neglecting your soul. You spiritually neglect your soul. See, what the problem is, is that we have a DNA, we, our DNA, and we have a sin issue in our DNA. We're all prone to want to live our life the way we want to live, whether it's control, whether it's this and that, whatever else it is, wanting to feed, wanting to please yourself, whatever else it is, it's all about me. That's what it is. That's what the problem of sin is. If the sin goes unchecked, if you're not in the word, if you're not in fellowship going to church, remember, this is the Sabbath. This is part of the commandments. You know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, blah, 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 right? To keep the Sabbath holy, right? It's not just sleeping in day, okay? It's keeping the Sabbath holy of worshiping and fellowshipping and, and, and being together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. This is the recharge. Does that make sense for this week, right? It's, if, you're not, if you're neglecting yourself by having sins unchecked, not in God's words, not in fellowship, not praying, not in, in studying God's word, not feeding from God's words, you, as a result, 
you will have spiritual and moral compromise. All right? Spiritual and moral compromise. I believe this. In every church, particularly our church, if you're serving here, right, you need to be an active Bible study. You need to be actively engaged in your work, in your feeding from God's words. You need to do that. Because if you don't have that, all the stuff that you do behind the scenes, it, it, it tells you, hey, I'm just tired, right? It tells you, why am I doing this? Because you're not, gra- you're not in the word of God, right? You're not in the word of God. So the result is spiritual and moral compromise. Let me just share with you how God works this out. This is amazing. Remember, God uses man's failure to fulfill his purpose. Let me give you some hope here. So the story of men's failure and the, the redeeming power of God, Genesis chapter 50. You guys know this story, the story of Joseph, right? So this is the great-grandson of Abraham, right? What happens is his brothers sold him to a bunch of desperados. No, that's from VeggieTales, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, a bunch of <laughs> slave traders, sorry. I said desperado. This is the VeggieTale thing coming in. We are talking about VeggieTales earlier. So, uh, so yeah, you know, carrots and all that stuff and peas. Okay, so, so he sold them, right? His brothers, his own brothers. So, okay, if you're thinking about this, God could use a better family, right? You're probably thinking. But God somehow used this family. He used the most obnoxious people with some issues in their family, right, to proclaim that he really is superior. That's the amazing thing. He didn't use the elite people that had it all together. If you come to my house, you'll, you, you'll see, okay? It's not, a, it's not in working order. I'm still in work in progress, as you are as well, right? Okay? So, so God uses, uh, in this very trying time, right, where Joseph, he gets, he gets sold, and then he gets uh, uh, um, uh, convicted of things that he, should, uh, that he didn't do, and he goes to jail, and then later, you know, he, he gets... He interprets dreams. That's amazing, right? Only, only God could do that. And then after that, he, 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 he interprets dreams that there's going to be a famine that's going to uh, occur in all the land. So he needs to tell the, 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 the Pharaoh at that time, they need to elect somebody to get this in order, to get Egypt ready. So therefore, he says, hey, you know what? I uh, sent you your interpreter of dreams. So, so, so the Pharaoh says, you know what? I'm going to... Um, you're going to be the director of FEMA, okay? You're the director of FEMA, and then after that, you're going to save this people, right? So he get, he's like second in command, second in command of Egypt. And then, lo and behold, he sees his brothers. Oh, man, I would have loved to have been that, that fly in the wall, right, just to see what's going on. So his brothers come. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, one of our brothers died, and my dad is still alive. And he goes, and, and, and then, then, you know, the story. He saves him. He reveals, I'm your, I'm your brother Joseph. You mean, really? Yeah, I'm your brother Je- God sent me to save you, to save my people. And then in, in verse, in, in chapter 50, this is amazing. I'm going to just read it to you. Chapter 50, this is when their father, Jacob, just died. So now that daddy is dead, <laughs> they go back to the drawing board. Hey, did you really mean that, that you forgave us? So this is them in panic. This is what he says, verse 15, chapter uh, 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sins, for they did you wrong. And now, please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God, uh, your father, of your father. And Joseph wept as they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants, right? Kind of too late now in my pen. But anyway, so, but verse 19, but Joseph said this to them. Do not be afraid, for am, am I in God's place? Question mark. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring this 
present result to preserve my people and live. See, when you, when you, when you are deeply, you know and you love Jesus, and you love his word, you love the fellowship time, anything bad in life that you have no control of, you think and say, how can God use this? See, that's the mature Christian. It's not, oh, yeah, why did it happen to me? Hey, see ya, bail, no more. I'm done with church. I'm done with this. Remember, this is a hospital of sinners, right? The mature Christian realized that God is over everything, and he's going to use no matter what the circumstances to bring about his word. That's, that is it. And if you don't understand that, I'm, just saying, I'm, t- I'm begging you to get in the word of God. Start off this year. Hey, this is only the second week, y'all. Okay? Start off with really knowing God and see his good in you, that he cares, he has a plan, he loves you, no matter what has happened, no matter if man did this, no matter if whatever, right? God uses that for his good. God is on the move. He saves people. Yes, he uses the most obnoxious way of doing it. Yes, even a famine even a beauty pageant, he puts key people in key places to do his work. Number two, it's point number two, and I'm done. But there's like point number two A, point number two B, point number C, okay? Point number two, God is the beholder of beauty, not man. God is the beholder of beauty, not man. So we see in verse, and there's a verse, right, the first part, this Esther was young, she was beautiful in form and face. And the Persians, right? See, the per- let me tell you about the Persians. They know about beauty. You're thinking, what? We have Royale and what is it? All, all these different cosmetic stuff. No, the Persians know what beauty is. Imagine this, 12 months under the regulation of the women for the days of their beautification, they were completed as follows. Six months of oil with of with oil of myrrh, and six months of spices and cosmetics for women. Imagine that. One year of having a limited, unlimited spa, top-notch spa treatments. Man, no wonder you would be beautiful, right? Who, who, which lady wouldn't want that? Un, unlimited massage and, you know, all those skin stuff they start putting and all those mud and all those different things, right? Okay? So imagine that. Let me just share with you an illustration. So uh, as you guys know, I got to go to Israel two years ago, and uh, one particular time we went to the the Dead Sea, right? So the Dead Sea, lowest elevation in the world, right? And there's nothing. There's, there's the sea is like a sea, right? There's nothing that grows, no fish, nothing like that, right? So I was thinking, elaborating, uh, thinking in my mind ahead as I walked down uh, to this lowest point of of the world, right? And I think I was thinking people were going to be laying out, just enjoying floating because you're, flo- you're floating, right? Really, uh, you don't need floaties or anything like that. But what I saw, I did not anticipate. I started seeing all these people put mud on their face. I wish I had a picture of it. Mud in their face. I don't know if it's like to exfoliate your skin or something. I don't know what that, that word even means, to be honest with you. It does something to your skin, Okay. So let me just tell you, this area of the Dead Sea, it's like a marketplace. They use the salts and they import it and they use that for merchandise that you and not not me, you ladies use on an everyday basis from the Dead Sea because of the salt and all those things. So let me tell you, the Persians knew what beauty is and they knew how to take care of these ladies, right? One year, okay? I'm not talking about some of you guys go to spas maybe for like one a, a few hours, right? Imagine going to a spa for a whole year, like every day. Bring it on. Okay, all right. So Queen Vashti's beauty, imagine this, was one thing, but the inner beauty of Esther surpassed them all. They were all beautiful. Again, this is like a beauty pageant, right? So here, verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the women, she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti, right? 
Esther's beauty. We know she was uh, beautiful in figure and in form. It says that. She had unlimited spa treatments. Did not, she did uh, not captivate the king. I'm sorry. Vashti did not captivate the king. But something, there's something about Esther, God's character, that caught his eyes and won his affection, eventually saving God's people. So let me just be real with you. Can we talk about this world that we live in? What is beauty? What is beauty? Let me just share with you. There's confusion on what beauty is and, the, when, and when purposes collide. Confusion on when beauty and purposes collide. Let me share with you an example. Okay? So the natural reaction is that as ladies, okay, I'm not a lady, so I don't know how that is, but I can only imagine, you're probably thinking, you know, these, these ladies, they just look beautiful. That's not fair. That's not fair, right? I mean, I don't have a model face, you're probably saying to yourself. And these ladies, they can eat whatever they want. They can gain a single pound, okay? She probably, these ladies probably wake up looking beautiful, okay? You're probably imagining that, okay? So the interchange is this. It has to do with purpose, it has to do with purpose. God created you for a purpose. God created uh, Esther for a purpose. She was beauty, beautiful in, in face and form. And all these other be- these ladies too, right? God has a design and purpose for you. He physically gave you your looks for the needs that he wants you to do. Right? What is it? See, I understand that most are not models. You probably know that. Most are not models, but have a deeper purpose in life. Okay? What is a woman's purpose? Let me just share with you this. A woman's purpose. Number one, you have to understand this. You're created in the image of God. You're created in the image of God. Right? You're the imago Dei is what they say. Right? You have a purpose. God, whoever you are, your body. So, so we, you know, as you guys know, I, I work with a lot of children, a lot of um, youth, et cetera, in my secular job. And we have a list every day at, at the hospital. We have a list every day, every day, okay? We have a list of these people, kids, that are there specifically wanting to end their life. And there are many of these girls, if you see, it's a very, very, um, almost kind of, you can almost predict. Lacerations, their skin, they've ingested, they had a breakup with their boyfriend or whatever, had a fight with mom and dad. There's a list every day that exists. And I, it saddens me, it should sadden you too, because they don't understand that they were created in the image of God. They don't understand that. And they need you. We need you. The girls, we just had a youth. They need you to share with them. They're they're beautiful beyond. They have a purpose in life. Number two, the purpose of a woman is to be a helper of a man. Right? You're probably thinking, I ain't married yet. Well, in the future, you will be, potentially. Right? Right? So current and in the future. See, man, God created man, and he saw that man was incomplete. So he created a helper, right, physically, mentally, spiritually, to help him. That's amazing, right? I would not be the same without my wife. Many of you guys probably would not either. If you think you would, then don't say it, okay? <laughs> I'll get you get like strict nine poisoning in your food and stuff. Anyway, sorry. I'm just thinking that way. <laughs> I don't want to see you in the bad list, okay? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the helper is a key role because we know that we need God. And sometimes God uses, often God uses the helper to make you and shape you to be the man that you want your husband to be. 
God wants your husband to be. Now, I'm not talking about little helper like that says, you know, if you're going, you know, like 70 miles per hour at night, oh, hey, you're going 70 out. No, not that helper. Not the helper that tells you, like, hey, it's green light. You need to go. No, not that helper. Okay? A helper within. A helper that encourages, which moves to the next point. And, and the woman's role is to encourage a man. We men in the workplace face a lot of criticism, especially if you stand up to what is right. You face a lot of cynicism. There's a lot of talks. There's a lot of cal- clamor. There's a lot of narrative about you. But if you do things right, that's why it goes back to who you are in God and how you live your life for him. A woman's role is to encourage the man, to build him up, not to tear him down. Don't say, oh, yeah, serves you right. No, don't say that. Even though if you wanted to, okay? You need to be, you're like, serve you right, big boy, right? (laughs) You need to build him up. And you need to encourage others as well. It's not just building up your spouse. Imagine the ladies that were involved this weekend. These ladies that took their time. Some even slept here or close to it. Yeah, would you? They want to sleep in their own warm bed, right? Next to their husband. Instead, they're sleeping in the the back over here, right? They do that because they love. They want to encourage these ladies. Let them know that God has a purpose for them. That you are beautiful beyond. Right? Okay? Now, number two... uh, over more moreover the purposes of women is to raise children as well right it's natural it's a fact that women are more nurturing okay that's a fact now i'm sure you guys see these people that want to transition to women i'm like why right you are not nurturing that is part of god's creation and being for women to be more nurturing to nurture, to raise children. Don't let anyone tell you that and, and think of you less if you are a stay-at-home mom. Don't. It's not created that way. If you guys know your history, before the Industrial Revolution, children work alongside their parents, mommy and daddy, with the trailer or whatever, a tractor, sorry, a tractor, Right? But what happens is in the Industrial Revolution, all the jobs went to the city. So the man had to travel to the city. So that had less proximity with him or uh, with his children and their father. Moreover, we have movement where women need to be in the workforce. God bless. If you are called to the workforce, wonderful. But your first priority is your home. Does that make sense, right? Actually, first priority is God. Then home, okay? Let me, let me kind of correct that a little bit, okay? On the flip side, as husbands, we don't say, hey, that's your role. I'm just going to be here with the remote control and looking at my golf show or whatever, a hunting show. No, that's not your purpose. Your purpose is also to help your spouse. Those, those are your children, okay? The TV is not your children. It's not the parent, okay? Facebook and all those, YouTube is not... The parent, you're the parent. All right, thank you. Thank you, son. All right, next. Woman's purpose is to be faithful stewards of God's gift within. Nurturing, teaching. Remember, if you don't know God's word, if you're, if you're just, you know, fake it till you make it, right? If you are not in God's word, you cannot teach. It's hard to, now I'm saying, it's hard to teach the young ones. Your goal, your, your goal is to teach whatever gifts that God's given you. The ladies here, they sing, right? They play instruments, whatever else it is. They lead, they plan, they're hospitable. Wow, amazing. God has a specific gift for you. Use those gifts. Last but not least, to submit to a biblical leadership of a husband. You're probably thinking, he used the S word. (sighs) No, submit to his biblical leadership, right? His biblical, that is the key. His biblical leadership. 
But have no, if he has no desire to follow God's word, to follow God, ah, it's going to be hard. I understand. It's hard. Remember, overall, he is responsible. He is accountable, right? So you want to submit first to God and submit to his biblical leadership. God first, then your husband. Now, let me just channel this a little bit to men. Because it also involves men's roles as well. What are our roles? Number one, well, first of all, speaking of beauty, you know, guys don't look at their face and say, hey, I have this, you know, all that stuff, you know. We don't go to spas, right? Amen? This may be some of you guys, right? So, so I, as you know, I am 5'9". I weigh about 180 pounds, okay? I'm not created as a football player, given, right? I'm more created as like, you know, ping pong or something like that. I mean... That's the fact, yo, right? I accept it. Hey, that's my gifting. Although I was good in football. I was a running back, in, uh, right? High school and, and, and uh, college. I could run. Let me tell you that. I, my kids know I could run. But I'm not created as a football player. I'm okay with that. But God has a deeper purpose for me. And I accept that wholeheartedly, right? God has a purpose for you. Number one, as men, our purpose is to take lead and charge. Let me tell you, ladies, from what I know, they love it when their husbands take lead and charge. It's like, man, I'm getting all hot and everything, right? They love it because they know that their man, their husband, loves the Lord and willing to take the lead. Not to say that they're perfect, but yet they are firm and kind at the same time. Does that make sense? Jesus does this very well. He's firm. You don't let things slide, but he's loving and uh, and empathetic at the same time. He respects them. He doesn't throw you out and, and things like that. He respects and he acknowledges them. That's who Jesus is. We have to emulate that. We have to follow that. So, so a leader takes lead. Number two, his confidence is in Christ. Not himself, or not how much he brings in the dough, okay? Not how, not how much in, in the, back, the bank account. His confidence is in Christ. Number three, he balances empathy with strength. He balances empathy with strength. So yeah, we're, you're, we have all these muscles and all these different things. Yeah, you're strong. You're, you have this deep tone of voice, commanding voice. But you're also empathetic. You understand. You listen. You communicate God's purpose for you. And then a few more things. You are the protector of your home. You are the protector of your home. Whatever goes inside, you should know. Every business, what's happening in the house, you should know. When I come in the house or I'm driving from my commute, I ask Joy. I'm like, hey, so hey, how, how did everything go today? What do I need? To? She's like, hey, Jackson, this is what happened you need to have a conversation with this. I'm like, okay, good, right, boom. We connect and we have those conversation, right? To protect the home. And last but not least, to be the provider of your home. Not, so sometimes we get this confused. We say, hey, I need to provide first. That's important, I understand, right? The Bible says, right, if you can't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. But sometimes we get it confused. We put leadership, we put confidence in Christ, we put empathy, balance with strength, and protector last and we put provider first well it's not it's not shaped that way you're called to lead you're called to protect you need to be aware and you need to balance strength with empathy i'll close with this eleven fifty nine. okay matthew 25 don't waste your purpose and your talents don't waste your purpose and talents i'm going to read to you matthew 25 Verse 14 says this, and I'll end. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To the one he gave five talents, to the other he gave two, to the other one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. And immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. And in the same manner, the one who received the two talents gained two more. But the one who received one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. 
Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received five talents came up and brought up five more talents, saying, Master, you've entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into joy of your master. Number two. Also to the one who received two talents came up and said, Master, you've entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And to the one also who had received one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seeds. And I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, slazy slave, you knew that I reap when I did not sow and gather where I I scattered no seeds. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent for him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But to the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Be faithful with what God's given you. Your characteristics, your purpose, be faithful. Be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. And we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this book. (laughs) How you could use even a beauty pageant to turn this whole mess around. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for caring for us. Thank you so much for telling us and encouraging us our role that we play a big part. We're not just here just to clock in and clock out and end the day, uh, end the week with 40 hours. We're here to do more. We have, we're here to do more. We're here to lead. We're here to serve. We're here to love you. We're here to be protectors, providers. We're here to share the gifts that you have for us more than ever. For the world needs it, Father, for you. We love you in Christ's name we pray. Amen.